Good day, dear friends, again, and we move on to the final lecture of the first day of the Ocean Lecture Hall. The topic is Microplastics in Marine Ecosystems. It is presented by our guest from Moscow State University Marine Research Center and uh, University of Edinburgh. Please welcome Anna Gebruk. Hello, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank Nastya for inviting me to do this lecture. I'm really happy to see that marine seminars are flourishing and continue despite all the difficulties. Besides, the distant format allows to include more people from different parts of the world. I'm happy to see all the people who have registered for today's lecture and express their interest in microplastics. I hope to be able to tell you something new and interesting today. A couple of words before we start. First of all, I would like to thank my multiple co-authors. During the lecture, I'm going to cite many papers. And I will uh, also tell you about the results of our work in the Marine Research Center in collaboration with other organizations, first of all with the Institute of Oceanology and with the Norwegian Institute of Water Research, NIVA. Evgeny Yakushov, one of our co-authors, joined today's lecture. A couple of words about me. My name is Anna Gebruk. I'm a researcher at the Marine Research Center in the University of Edinburgh, which where I'm currently situated. I would like to say from the beginning that I am a biologist, a zoologist, so the main focus of my today's lecture would be on microplastics in the sea and uh, how they interact with marine ecosystems and marine organisms. I am neither chemistry nor oceanology expert, so if you have any toxicology questions, like one about plastics being the vector of transfer of organic pollutants, probably I won't be able to answer such question. But I will share contacts and names of people who can, who have more expertise in the field. Anytime, if you have any questions during the lecture, please write them in the chat. I'll try to monitor them, otherwise uh, we will deal with them later at the end of the lecture. So I told you uh, things I'm not going to talk about. Let's say what I actually am going to talk about. I would like to cover four blocks of information in this lecture. First of all, as I'm not aware whether listeners are familiar with the notion of microplastics, we will start from the very beginning and I will say what microplastics actually are, how do they get to the sea, how they interact with marine ecosystems and marine organisms. The second part uh, will be dedicated to the propagation of plastics in the ocean and in the Arctic region in particular. There are two reasons for that. First, the Arctic region is my field of interest and my expertise. And second, because before recently, uh, before 2017, uh, the Arctic region was considered a plastic-free zone, so to speak, because uh, with very unpopulated shores and low anthropogenic activity compared to other zones, in consequence, the pollution rate must be lower. But recent publications prove otherwise. Plastics have been revealed in the sediments, in the bento uh, deposits, in the ice, in the water, inside the organisms. We will cover that more in detail. In the third part of the lecture, I would like to talk about uh, three projects I participated in, uh, projects done with Evgeny and Alexander uh, last year, and one about the plastic accumulations in benthos organisms done in the Petrosa Sea. The last part will be quite short. I will share some references and invite you to a number of events, because if you are interested in plastic, uh, this might be of interest for you. Uh, 
Last words of introduction. Some of the slides are in English because the illustrations and comments are taken from our papers that are in English. I'll try to explain everything, but in case something is not clear, please write your questions in the chat. I will comment on everything with pleasure. So, uh, let's start from the very beginning. What is microplastic? Here you see the picture and a number of basic definitions and general numbers. The first one seems pretty revealing to me. According to different estimations, up to 80% of the whole garbage produced by humanity, anthropogenic trash, is garbage classified as plastic items. Up to 10% of this trash goes to the ocean. It is really hard to say exactly how many pounds or tons of it we can find. Because many scientists do their research in different parts of the ocean and they take into account various parameters, focusing, for example, on the surface plastic research or alternatively on plastics in the seafloor sediments, but uh, we know the exact amount of plastic items produced by the humanity and we know that it grows relentlessly since 50s or 60s when mass production of plastic has started. In 2018, it was revealed that, um, that it was produced 350 million tons of plastic items, and a big part of which goes to the ocean. So what is plastic? It's not a chemical in itself, it is more of a class of substances. Plastics is the name normally given to any artificial polymers that have thermostatic or thermoplastic properties. The usage of the term microplastics also depends on the researcher and on the paper. Normally their dimensions are to be defined at the beginning. The most common definition goes as follows. Any type of plastic less than 5 mm is called microplastic in length in case of fiber and in diameter if we talk about beads. Particles less than 1 micron are called nanoplastics and this is a completely new category. Very few papers are written about it because it is so hard to register and so hard to define chemically. But this category exists. Today we will be focusing mostly on microplastics, on uh, particles from 1 micron to 5 millimeters. And one more basic notion that I would like to introduce, as it is very important, especially for uh, marine microplastics, primary and secondary microplastics. By primary plastics we understand um, plastics that were produced like this, small, less than 5 millimeters, like microfiber in textile or microbeads in cosmetics. Secondary plastics are the result of partial breakdown of a bigger plastic item, like plastic bags or plastic bottles, or, which is more common at sea, fishing nets. Next point that I would like to cover is literature on the subject. In recent years, not only the number of plastic items produced is getting bigger, so is the number of publications and the amount of attention from the international community. The stats here are quite interesting. If you search for papers with the word microplastic in the title, by the year 2000 you will only find about a hundred, but as of today there are more than a thousand of them, meaning during the last decade the number of papers has grown tenfold. It is clear that young scientists find it hard to choose the right angle to tackle the issue, as there are so many papers. That's why I'm showing a small table that I made, in which you can see references for papers and reviews that can be a great starting point to get the idea of marine microplastics. First, I would like to stress the importance of the two titles uh, that are in bold, Avio et, uh, or et Alia 2016. It is a very good review of the papers existing back then about the propagation of microplastics in the ocean. 
about their zone of accumulation, their interaction with various organisms and its toxicological consequences. It's not very big, it's well written and has many references, so if you are interested, I recommend it. The second document is a Gesam Preview to, uh, 2019. It is the group of experts on the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection. It's a working group inside the IMO, International Maritime Organization, that deals with the world's ocean pollution. This review is focused on methodology. It's the most complete one so far. It has analytical data and recommendations on how to study microplastics. It's quite big. Uh, it considers microplastics in the water, in the seafloor sediments, etc. Many recommendations about the equipment, for example, which one is better for chemical analysis of the microplastics. If you are uh, interested in the Arctic uh, microplastics, or benthos microplastics, for example, I wrote my email in the lower part of the slide, so I will be happy to share the papers that I had found on the subject. Now let's go to the literature scanning. I would like to focus on two main points. What happens to microplastics when they go to the ocean and how do they interact with different groups of organisms? Let's repeat one more time to emphasize the scale of the problem. I will uh, give you two citations about the quantitative distributions of the microplastics. The first one is from the avioid earlier that I mentioned, that gives the quantitative overview as of 2016. Uh, uh, 300,000 tons of plastic is floating on the ocean surface. They are concentrated in the accumulation zones. And the second one is from a paper that was published last week in Science. It cites shocking data. The surface plastic accounts for approximately 1% of the whole pollution of the ocean. The rest is accumulated in the deep sea ecosystems. And we will talk about this in detail too. The pictures that I put at the upper part of the slide are to illustrate the following idea. When we imagine fauna interacting with plastic, we can easily imagine them in contact with my microplastic pictures showing mammals, reptiles, birds, stuck in the plastic items. Uh, so all these pictures are widely covered by the media. So I'm sure many of us have seen them. But marine life interacting with microplastics is a topic which is not very well covered. That's why I would like to cover it in detail. So, how plastics and microplastics get to the ocean? The polluting sources are divided into two clusters. Terrigenous sources and marine ones. Terrigenous ones are continental drift by rivers and wastewaters. If the zone is populated, we are talking about the drift from the shore. Terrigenous pollutions accounts for the bigger part of the whole microplastic marine pollution, up to 80%, according to the recent estimations. At the same time, offshore and marine industries pollution, like fishing and navigation, it ex they exist, but they bring much less harm. Fishing nets that were one co once considered as the major polluting factor are only responsible for 10%. Some regions have their specific pollution sources and drifts. In the Arctic, for instance, ice can take the plastic, capture it and transport it to long distances, but anyway, the plastic gets to the ocean. So what happens to it further depends on the properties of the polymer. We are talking about dimensions and density. Here you see again a quite illustrative table from Avio et Arlia 
that shows that the most popular polymers have various density levels compared to the seawater. Some of them is comparable to the sea water or lighter, some of them are heavier. The heavy ones are on the bottom of the table, they sink on the sea floor and integrate into the benthos ecosystems, whilst the lighter ones like polyethylene or polypropylene, the most common ones, they stay in the water or float on the surface. That's how famous garbage patches are formed. So, what happens to the integrated plastic? It interacts with living organisms. Here I'm using the diagram of my colleague from the Institute of Oceanology, Anna Zalota, that illustrates quite well the biodiversity and the dimensions of organisms. I would like to stress that the contact between plastics and organisms is defined by their mutual dimensions. For example, on the bottom you see organisms that are less than one a millimeter, nano and micro so and phytoplankton and bacterial plankton. For them, microplastics are comparable in size or sometimes even bigger. So for them, plastispheres are formed. What is a plastisphere? Big plastic items become their new environment. Plastic particles floating in the ocean are biofouled and colonized by the smaller organisms, so the biodegradation process takes place. Partial breakdown and degradation take place. Apart from this, the colonized plastic objects uh, can become vectors for biological invasions and long-distance species dispersal. It's logical to think that if the item is biofouled and colonized, a certain system is formed, then plastic garbage is drifted by the ocean currents, it can be drifted at a very long distance, they are hard to control. Here are the publications about the so-called epiplastic communities. Those examples are from the Northern Atlantic and Australia. Different dimension groups are considered. Take a look if you're interested. The point is that in both cases, all the plastic samples were subject to biofouling. Various organisms were found on their surface, we are talking not only small cyanobacteria, and, uh, etc., but also invertebrates. Not all of them are biofoulers, some of them came in search for food supply, but the phenomenon is evident. I haven't seen papers uh, dedicated to this phenomenon in Arctic. So, if you are interested or if you have students that are interested in plastic biofouling in, Ar in the Arctic, it's a great and uh, very under-researched new topic. So, if we go back to the dimensional diagram, if we move up to bigger organisms, for them, Particles are like food dimension-wise, and for them ingest, uh, ingestion is the most common course of events. Then two scenarios are possible. First, of, uh, first one, if particles are not accumulated but rather go through the gastrointestinal tract, they reside in the feces and uh, then sink settling on the seafloor. The second scenario is worse if particles are numerous, if they are big or if they are accumulated in the tissue of the animal, they stay in the body and they are transported into the food web.
This organism is ingested by an animal from the next trophic level, and that's how the accumulation and drift go on. We talk about uh, two phenomena, bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is accumulation in the body during its life and development, and biomagnification means accumulation in the food web, so gradual ingestion. I hope that you see that biological objects contribute to the vertical transfer of plastic to the benthos. Either with the death of the animal, in the tissues, or with the feces, or as a result of biodegradation, anyway, sooner or later, everything goes down to the seafloor. Next point, uh, which is worth discussing, is ingestion. We saw that ingestion is the most common way of interaction. But what are the consequences for the organism? Those questions are tackled by ecotoxicology. And this, these toxicological effects can be divided into two groups, physiological or mechanical ones and biochemical ones. Physiological effects are quite evident when plastic is uh, perceived as food and the organism is thinking that it is feeding but it, uh, its needs are not satisfied so as a result its stomach is stuffed by non-nutritious mass physiological activity reduces uh, loss of appetite sometimes even reproductive failure or death can occur biochemical consequences are more complex because they are related to chemical interactions plastic polymers in general are almost non-reactive but those particles have high surface area to volume ratio. So if they uh, stay in the water for a long time, their surface can absorb different substances. It can be pollutants that existing in the background are not dangerous, like high density metals or mercury. But there are also materials that are added during the production process in order to change its properties, to enhance, to enhance its plasticity or resilience, for example, like biphenyl A. All those substances can be accumulated on the surface of the plastic item, so what happens to them inside the organism's body? This is a very complicated question. There are very few publications that show that consequences are twofold. First, these pollutants from the surface are captured by the epithelium, tissue cells, and then transported uh, to the body of the organism. So, for example, if the surface of a plastic particle is covered with a, a pollutant and we feed them to the fish, after some time this pollutant can be registered in the fish tissues. The second possible consequence is plastic particles translocation. This is found uh, thanks to a muscles case study. If the concentration of plastic in the water is high, Plastic is found in the circulatory systems of muscles, so the plastic is found in the bodies, inside. On the diagram you can see examples of physiological and biochemical consequences associated to the pollutants that can be found on the surface of plastic items from endogenous hormones, generation suppression, to inflammations and photosynthesis inhibition. 
If you're interested, I can give you more references. Uh, some of them are at the slide, but the real question is what happens with the relocation of plastic in human body? For example, mussels are one of the most widespread aqua species, but there are many other water species that make part of the human diet. I have no answer so far. Neither does science in general. So far, there is no evidence of translocation of plastics into the human body, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. Maybe the question is not yet researched enough. The first part of the review is over. I would like to talk about plastic uh, in the ocean, where it is accumulated and how uh, is the situation in the Arctic. Let's go back to the AVIO paper. I like it a lot. Those are data for 2016 that shows uh, parts of the ocean where the plastic was found and in what quantity. This is not the complete version of the table. If we see the whole one, we will see that the plastic was found in all the oceans, but not in the Arctic Ocean. Speaking about the biggest concentration, uh, we are talking about ocean gyres, uh, sub-equatorial ones. They are described uh, at the moment, northern and southern Atlantic, northern and southern Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Their formation is due to global water circulation in the world ocean, wind drifts, if you are interested in the hydrophysical aspects of gyre formation, I recommend Van Sibyl publications from 2012 and 2015. I would like uh, to uh, cover the first one in detail because it not only registers the formation of the gyres, but also shows models on a different time scale. 10, 50 or 100 years. As a result, the modeling shows that the sixth potential gyre is creating in the Arctic region, in the Barents Sea. Back then, it was only a theory, no in situ studies have been carried out. Next publications that I would like to talk about uh, Kozar et al. from 2017 that describes the results of the Circumpolar expedition and finally provides quantitative data about the floating plastic in the Arctic. The results show that indeed high concentration of the floating microplastics is revealed in the Barents Sea near Nova Zimla. Kozar as Van Sebil associates this with the thermohaline drift from the North Atlantic accumulation gyre. So after 2016 we considered that there is plastic in the Arctic, but this plastic is transported from the North Atlantic. The situation about, uh, in other parts of the Arctic is not covered by the existing papers. Another publication that I would like to cite, I mentioned it at the beginning, I think you might have heard about it last week. A cane uh, with the co-authors published an article in Science that considers the accumulation of plastics in the deep zones of the ocean. The main idea is that indeed the majority of plastics is accumulated in the deep sea, namely at 600-900 meters depth. It is not related to the distance from the shore, it is associated with topography and geomorphology of the bottom relief and with the patterns and intensity of both uh, bottom currents. I'm not going into the details right now. Take a look at the paper, it just appeared. I would like to cover the topic of, of what happens to the plastic when um, that uh, goes to ecosystems, despite common perceptions 
Sea floors, floors and deep water ecosystems are not dead fields. They are parts of the world's ocean with its own life and communities of invertebrates. Normally there are two types of them. They are uh, either non-mobile fauna, depending on organic mass coming from the water column, or filter feeders that take organic substance from water or from soil after it sinks. And there are mobile organisms that are actively moving. They are either predators or scavengers. Well, they move a lot. So what do we know about plastics inside of them? Very little, in fact. Very few publications appeared recently. Here you have uh, some res uh, some references. Taylor uh, two, uh, 2016 is the very first paper that deals with the plastic accumulations in Benthos site and data from Atlantics and the Indian Ocean. The next paper is Bergman uh, 2017. It's not about fauna, but it about uh, it is about deep water sediments in the Arctic Ocean near Spitsbergen House Garden Observatory. In this region, a lot of plastic was found, so it is easy to imagine that it is accumulated in Benthos fauna too, but it is not researched yet. Next work is from 2017, and it is done by my colleagues in Scotland. Uh, it deals with plastics in deep sea fauna in the North Atlantic, in Mingula Reef. And the last paper uh, from 2018 is the first one about benthos in Arctic, but it only covers the Chukotsk Sea and the Bering Sea. There is no publications about plastic accumulation in benthos in other Arctic seas, and this is the knowledge gap so-called knowledge gap that we are working on right now. Here is the working map of the Marine Research Center for, stud uh, for studies of ingested microplastics in seafloor fauna. Our working polygon is the Pechora Sea, but last year we also took some samples on the course of the academic Kildishev boat in the Kara Sea, in the Laptev Sea and the East Siberian Sea. Those are two samples I would like to describe more in detail. Here are some pictures from the last year. It seems like a social advertisement of the work in the Arctic region, because we look so happy and smiley here. The second pic is more truthful, because washing the sediments is so fun, but after a couple of hours of work on the deck, it gets cold and we smile much less. So what uh, did we do? Hydrobiological and hydrochemical units worked together in the strip. It was a complex study where we were searching for plastics in different parts of the ecosystems. We gathered uh, samples of the fauna, of the seafloor sediments, surface waters and from the water wall. So far I have nothing, nothing to say about the sediment probes. The preliminary results, though, show that plastic is found in all the regions, in all the three seas. We haven't yet identified any pattern. Uh, we are going to do that in the near future. We are going to publish a paper about plastic in the water. We are preparing this publication right now. Evgeny Yakushev is going to be the first author. Main results go as follows. First of all, plastic has been found in the water of all the three seas. Second, uh, plastics 
in the surface and under surface layers have different properties, meaning chemical structure and morphological properties of the particles. Uh, they were different types and dimensions, microfiber and microbeads. Uh, we think that patterns in those layers are related to different reasons and mechanisms. We analyzed the salinity gradient and we found that on the surface the biggest concentration of plastics correspond to less salty water. It makes us think about the relation with a river runoff and river plumes. In the undersurface layers, the relation is reverse. The zones with more plastic correspond to higher salinity. It might be related to the waters coming from the Atlantic Ocean. This idea is not new. The blue indicator in the upper picture shows the movement of these waters. This is what uh, Kozar et Alia mentioned in their publication, the, this plastic transportation from this zone. We must understand that further to the east, these waters go under the surface, so the plastic uh, is controlled by other patterns from that moment. Those are our first results. I think it was very interesting. I hope that the paper is going to come out soon. One more picture to illustrate the importance of rivers in the uh, Arctic. Traditionally, in the literature, the Arctic is uh, considered to be not very populated. And indeed, if we look at the number of big cities in the Arctic Circle, we see that uh, there are not uh, quite a lot of them, these orange points here. But however, if we consider the catchment area, the picture is different because the Arctic Ocean amounts to 11 or 14 uh, or percent of the whole continental runoff. It is a lot. And Great Siberian rivers contribute a lot to this amount. The Ob River, the Yenisei River and the Lena River. We think that uh, river plumes that are, they are forming are one of the pollution sources in the Arctic, but this question needs to be researched further. Second example is um, studies of plastic accumulated in benthos in the Pechora Sea, namely studies of diet of the decapons. A short digression about what kinds of commercialized decapods we talk about in the Pechora Sea only to uh, emphasize the fact that both red king crab and snow crab are uh, different species. They were both transported from the North Pacific region, but they have different history and biology. Red king crab was brought in the 50s for fishing purposes, and a snow crab is registered uh, and found since the 90s, but it is unknown how he got in the region. It was probably transported with the ballast waters, because at the moment they were not as strictly regulated. Anyway, both species exist in the region, they are commercialized, moreover snob crab commercial runoff is uh, even higher than the one of the red king crab. This picture shows uh, snow crab propagation in the Pechora Sea. Now it's found everywhere. Next picture shows the a sampling station. Here we took the samples of the seafloor fauna. We've had to use uh, different uh, special techniques to catch the crab, 
and uh, compare the samples with the other benthos organisms. A couple of words more about methodology. Uh, we used uh, methods that are normally used in these conditions. We combined dissection and digestion methods. First, you dissect the crab's stomach. Then you put what was inside in the trypsin solution in order to divide organic matter from the artificial polymers. After that, the solution is washed over 40 microns metal stream. The particles that stay are potentially considered as plastics and are to be defined. Here are the results. I'm not going to compare the dyes of both crabs because we don't have a lot of time for that. But if you're interested, I will share the preprint with you. In the picture, you see the diets uh, uh, that we found. You see the titles of the speeches on the slide in English and in Latin. In all three bentos decapods on the bottom, you can see a red bar uh, showing the plastic that was found, and the medium number for all decapods was 28%. So roughly every third crab in the Petrora Sea has plastic in its stomach. Here, uh, here is how the particles look. They are all classified as macrofiber, the most common type of plastic. They can be made of different materials, uh, they can have uh, different size, shapes and colors. As to geographical distribution, we can't say much in this paper because there were only three stations, but uh, plastic was found in all the three of them. And preliminarily we can say that the most was found in the station with the biggest benthos biomass volume. It is also a place that is also valorous feeding area. It is pretty worrying because walrus is a protected species in the Petrora Sea and uh, its feeding resources are polluted with plastic. We need more stations to provide more information about the mapping. This is what we plan to do. This is what we can say about plastic in different species. In this work, we consider uh, two groups of uh, organisms, benthos decapodes, they are omnivorous organisms, or mollusks, they are filter feeders with two types of uh, feeding systems. By FF we labeled filter feeders, they take food from the water wall, and by DF, we labeled deposit feeders, they capture particles after they sink in the soil. In this di uh, diagram, with the frequency of plastics for every species, we see that the frequency of plastics for omnivorous is much higher than for both filter feeders. It is one more evidence of biomagnification that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. Here you see another picture to illustrate all of the above, to demonstrate it in a better way. We see plastic in the water column. Uh, primary plastic that was manufactured in order to be this small with these dimensions and the secondary plastics that appeared as a result of partial breakdown uh, of bigger items. 
then these particles are included into the food web that becomes a vertical transit to the seafloor because particles either go through the gastrointestinal system or accumulate in the body and then sink. In the sea we see mollusks capturing particles from water or soil and we see predators that move uh, around and ingest even more plastic with their victims due to bi biomagnification. Let's do a small recap for some conclusions. In the first paper we analyzed plastic floating in the Arctic Ocean. We deduced that uh, Siberian river runoffs plays an important role in the surface plastic propagation, namely river plumes patterns that are related to the surface uh, plastic propagation. At the same time, under surface water, microplastics, uh, however, is different from the ones on the surface and is probably came from the Atlantic waters. Speaking about the plastic accumulation in the Bentos ecosystems, near 20% of the stomach fillings of all the researched animals contained ingested microplastics. The highest frequency is observed in the snow crab, which is an important commercialized species in the region. Mobile decapods in general accumulate more microplastics than filter feeders. Here I would like to end my scientific part. I would say just a couple of words uh, about some interesting information that can be interesting for you. As I already said, if you're interested in the topic uh, after this lecture, you can uh, go and research what I put here on this slide. Those are some uh, social media accounts that uh, publish uh, new information about relevant papers and events. And the last uh, picture, when I uh, do uh, lectures and participate in events, many people ask me, okay, it is clear that there is a lot of plastic in the ocean and it's bad, bad for nature, bad for people, but what we can do? And so the answer to this is reduce, reuse, recycle. This is really important. Yes, uh, we can, uh, we must enhance the purification uh, stations uh, in the industrial sector, but in your individual usage you can also make an impact, you can reduce uh, your um, plastic usage, uh, not using single-use plastic bags or plastic uh, bottles, for example. And you can recycle too. Of course, in Norway it's easier than in Moscow, but still you can do it. And the last slide today, uh, so, uh, those are the uh, conclusions that I used for another lecture. But here, I, I think I can repeat them. Despite many researchers, uh, research and studies that are uh, already done in the field, we know really little about uh, how the plastic is propagated in the Arctic, uh, about the impact of the riverine plastics, uh, uh, what are the consequences for living organisms and their uh, ingestion of the plastics. And we understand that plastic exists in the Arctic and there is a lot of them. So I think this is what uh, the papers are going to be about uh, 
in the future. And uh, the la my last point, uh, to be really effective and uh, to have great results, we need to elaborate some standards in the field uh, because uh, different equipment is used, different guidelines, different instructions, different uh, quantitative parameters are used by different uh, scientists. Um, I, now I see some efforts that are done in order to uh, make the situation better, but for now they are only efforts. So please uh, join us in this uh, research of the Arctic microplastics. I think this is it. Thank you very much, Anna, for the lecture. I'm sure that such a topic encourages our listeners to ask questions and to pay serious, serious attention to the usage of the plastic products in everyday life. So please send your questions to the section below and we will forward them to our lecturers and publish them shortly. Many thanks to our media partner Kamsamolska Pravda for joining our agenda and also broadcasting on their platform. So this concludes the first day of the Ocean Lecture Hall. The announcement of the second day has already been published on the screen, so we're looking forward to see you here tomorrow.